Hello, good evening, everyone. I'm Andrea Piero, Director of the Visiting Artist Program at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this evening's lecture by visiting artist Tal R. This program is presented in partnership with SAC's Department of Painting and Drawing, and I'd like to thank my colleagues in the department for their support and collaboration. Additional support is provided by grants from the Illinois Arts Council Agency and the National Endowment for the Arts. SAC's Visiting Artist Program is dedicated to hosting a variety of presentations by internationally recognized artists, designers, and scholars each academic year to foster a greater understanding and appreciation of contemporary art and culture. Um, it's so exciting to have Tal here in Chicago, and I'd like to thank him for taking the time out of his busy schedule to travel here from Copenhagen. At the end of the lecture, and actually um, possibly throughout the talk this evening, Tal will be taking questions from our from the audience. We will have microphones circulating um, from our staff, so please raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. And I just want to mention, I hope you'll be able to join us again next Tuesday when we welcome uh, visiting artist Juliana Huxtable, Tuesday, October 11th. That will take place um, here at 6 o'clock. And now I'd like to welcome to the podium Terry Myers, professor and chair of SAC's Painting and Drawing Department, to introduce Tal R. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you, um, everyone, for being here tonight. It is my great pleasure this evening to introduce Talar, an artist from Denmark who has been working and exhibiting since the early 1990s. I have known Tal and his work since 1997, and over the years I have observed the international reach of his work expand exponentially. His work is exceptionally idiosyncratic yet informed by an expansive view of the history of painting and, by extension, art itself, creating a potent model for emerging painting to continue after modernism and postmodernism without apology or a return of the manipulative and worn out death of painting mantra. Alongside other painters of his generation, like Daniel Richter, Laura Owens, and Chris Ophelia, Tal deserves major credit for giving younger painters plenty of permission without suggesting that anything goes. I am drawn to the playful and critical aspects of his work, as well as the complexities between them that make him absolutely relevant today. As professor of painting and drawing and current department chair here at SAIC, I know firsthand the high regard that serious painting students have for Tal's work. For the past few years, his name has been at the top of their list of desired visiting artists, and I am grateful that he was able to make the trip and spend some quality time with us this week. Tal's exhibition track record is world class. Since 1994, he has had more than 80 solo exhibitions and has participated in numerous group exhibitions. His solo exhibitions have been at galleries and institutions, including the Kunsthalle Mannheim in Germany, the Bonifantin Museum in Maastricht, the Camden Art Center in London, Chime and Reed in New York, Kunsthalle Dusseldorf, the Museo Brasilio de Escultura in Sao Paulo, the Gallery in Taxi Palais in Innsbruck, Austria, the Städtisch Gallery Wolfsburg in Germany, the Pinakothek de Moderne in Munich, the Aros, Aros Kunstmuseum in Denmark, Sommer Contemporary Art in Tel Aviv, Contemporary Fine Arts Berlin, and the Institute for Modern Kunst in Nuremberg, among many others. Next May, the Louisiana Museum of Modern Art in Denmark will present a major survey exhibition called Academy. For this, I have been invited to put together an extended conversation with Tao for the catalog a dialogue that will include a discussion of the teaching of art, and Tal held a professorship at the Kunst Academy Dusseldorf from 2005 to 2014. I may also incorporate things said during this week, so I hope there will be some great questions later, meaning I might um, come looking for you if you had something amazing to say that I will want to include in this dialogue for the book. 
Full disclosure, several months after Tal confirmed his visit, I completed an agreement to write a monograph on his work that will be published in the fall of 2017, a book that will focus upon his painting, although of course it would be inappropriate and it will be impossible not to take on the massive breadth of his production, paintings, drawings, prints, sculptures, ceramic furniture, fashion, and on and on. Without giving too much away, by the book, I can describe the plan for my approach as a three-part structure based upon the well-known categories of people, places, and things. At this point, I see this structure functioning in two, very, two different yet interrelating ways, the first being obvious, which then helps establish the second. On their face, Tell's works depict people, places, and things, so much so that it would be possible to categorize everything quite efficiently and leave it at that. What is more provocative about his work is the extent to which each of these categories are reworked within the varied states of his painting. For example, a painting, even a so-called abstract one, as a person with a personality, personality and an attitude, and it doesn't hurt that the work is constantly sexy. Another painting as a place, a construction site, of literal material, including collage, photography, sculpture, etc., and then yet another painting as a thing in the obvious sense, but also as a kind of creature, sometimes even a monster, or a kind of building or scaffolding, a thing to put other things in or on. The complexity and raw beauty of all of this is what makes his work stand out. Even after 20 years, Tal's world is more than ever someplace I want to stay. Please join me in welcoming Talar. Um, hello. I hope you can understand my poor Scandinavian English. Um, I, I had several titles for this uh, talk. Uh, one was the Deaf Institute. What means Deaf Institute? It means that once I pass by, uh, oh, here's light. Okay, I walk in there. I once passed by this uh, institute for deaf people, and there was a there was a playground, and on the on the wall of this playground there was a very simple drawing. There was a big eye, and I always thought this was so precise and so beautiful that it's even bad to explain why. But if you have a place where people can't hear and where they can't really talk, then the eye becomes so important. So what to draw on a wall of a deaf institute is an eye. And that leads me to the next thing. Um, I've, I've done this quite a few times, I mean, being invited and asked to talk about my work. And on one hand, it's really easy. It's just to start. You can start from the beginning, from the middle. But actually, it's, it's a kind of a tricky area because what, going back to the Deaf Institute, what should an artist actually say about his own work? I mean, there is a reason why I, I didn't write a novel or I didn't make a film. I make these kind of mute objects and I make them so I can walk away. So what should I actually say next to a painting? I think if an artist starts to, you know, to be a, a good person, a good student, and try to contextualize, put themselves in art history, they are doing it wrong. That's a major mistake. I think that's not the artist's job and it's something very sticky to try. Then the other thing you can do is like, you can start with private anecdotes. Why did you do this work? Where does it come from? And that's, in a way, always quite interesting. That's like candy, to get all these small stories. But I don't know if that actually leads you anywhere deeper into the work or to the ideas behind the work. So it is quite tricky. What should an artist actually say next to their own work? Um, and it hasn't become more easy. It is one hand easy, and I can do it. But on the other hand, it's... Um, it's tricky. So I want to put one more word in front, the word that I, I'm happy that it exists, 
in Danish and it also exists in English. It's irresponsible. I think an artist, when you do an artwork, if you feel, oh, I'm ready to do this work, I'm ready to, to paint the horse in the horizon, I know exactly how to do it, I am a responsible person. Because usually in the, in the real world, outside art, whenever you want to say something, do something, you should know what you want to do, how you want to do it, that's being responsible. But actually, great art is the opposite. You have to feel irresponsible. That means you have to feel like this, that you know you want to go somewhere, but you have no clue how to get there. That's a bit irresponsible. You don't want to let your kid out on that walk. But that's a good beginning, irresponsible. And I'm also doing this talk in an irresponsible way. That means I don't plan it. I have no idea. I mean, it's me. I'm going to talk about me, so what is there to plan? But if I would do this in a responsible way, I would hate every word that I would say. So before going into images, I, I also, I just picked out images, because if I, if I don't know what to say, at least we can look at some images. <laughs> but I'm going to start, I wrote one word here, failure 1996. Do you have the word in English, fiasco? No. Yeah, yeah okay. That's even more grand than failure, right? That's really when you land on your stomach, right? So in, in, in 96, I convinced this kind of a local independent space that I could show my work there. I walked in there and I explained that I had a project for them and I would do like a sound piece and a wall, something on the wall, and I had everything under control. I was responsible. And I think I talked so fast that the people sitting there, they just wanted to, me to get out of the room. And anyhow, you had to pay everything yourself because it was just run by artists. So they said, okay, you can do it, you can do it. So I had everything planned and I went there on a Tuesday and the show was gonna open on a Friday. And I knew on Friday, all the real artists, all the people with the right sneakers would be there. <laughs> so I had to prove myself. So, I started installing, I, I wanted to do, I can't even remember, some kind of wall painting, and there should be this loudspeaker that played into itself again, and I, I was like, I was being responsible. But you know, Tuesday morning I started, and Tuesday afternoon I get this feeling, you know, when you've said something embarrassing then you can't pull back, you start getting red in your face, and you know that this is a disaster. And at the end of the week, you are going to be that disaster. So something quite special. I think in those three days, I learned more than in six years of art school. That's a bit of being a bit cynical, but in a way, I learned a, a major thing. You could say a major free fall. Because what I did in those three days that I, saying English, I kept my guns in that sense that I, I still kept the idea that I w what kind of atmosphere I wanted to create. I just threw everything on the floor that I had planned. And I had like a week of kind of just walking around with the gun and like just looking for objects, looking for ideas for this kind of idea. And I would pick up stuff on the street and I would just turn things around. And in a way, I was just fighting not to be... Uh, wonderful person, not to make great art, but just to survive major failure. And I, no, I also said to myself, if, if I'm going to fail, at least I'm going to fail in grand style. <laughs> and when, when Friday happened and all these people came, and I, was, I had no fear anymore because I, I know in a way something very real happened, something that was without discussion, and something real was there in front of me, something that had a a rhythm, and I even saw something that I didn't have a language for. When I look back at that show, it was not about whether it was a great show or not, but it moved me a lot. I understood there that, and what I think I've been practicing and, and stabilizing over so many years, is that whenever you have an idea, there's always a free fall. And that's where the word irresponsible come into place. And they were where we are back to the Deaf Institute. Um, 
okay, maybe let's just look at a picture. And I have this small beeper here. This is a painting from when I was still a student. Um, I think it's around 98. And uh, I also admit when I look at this painting, I feel embarrassed because I think I see more mistakes than I see things that I really enjoy today. But I think it's, I think it's quite important to understand what happened here because at that point, in the 90s, if you were interested in painting and if you were a painter, that was similar in Europe to be stupid because nobody did painting. And if you did painting, that was just about investigating the media, the possibility of things, you know, things happening. Or you would have a French philosopher writing something and you would do a painting next to that. That was actually really being the way. And then some things started happening and it didn't really happen in painting. It, it, I saw it first time in video that there was a speci a spe especially one guy who was supposed to be a conceptual artist. And he always failed with his conceptual works um, because his life was actually just about drinking and getting naked at night. So suddenly in the middle of this, and it's not me, I would admit it, I would be very proud, but it was not me. You know who it is, Peter Lent. So, so that, <laughs> so Mr. Lent suddenly, out of the blue, did a video where he was just dancing naked or drunk at night. And this was, it was, again, it was not really about whether this was a great artwork, but somebody just said, this is what I am about, and this is where my work is going to be. It's not a French writer. It's not strategy. It's not um, investigating blue this way and red that way. With all respect for that, but that, you know, every form gets into a corner, and that kind of academic approach, mid-90s was in a corner. It led nowhere, and especially as a student, where he said, my life is like this, why can't art, like the music that I like is in the middle of, of my work, the clothes that I wear is in the middle, everything I read is in the middle, why should paint be over there in the corner? So I was looking for a way to paint narratives. And then suddenly one day I wanted to paint my living room and you know, like, I mean, I was not really a teenager, but <laughs> maybe in a way I was a teenager. I painted loudspeakers and a lamp and a, and a stereo. But what's important about this painting is that I painted this kind of color field at the bottom and I found out it's a trick. I found out when I could do anything. I could even do a very abstract painting. And if I did this on the bottom, that meant it had gravity. And that meant it belonged to a world where somebody can, can walk. That's all it meant. And I decided that I would use this as long as it made sense. All the small dots, it's like when you play stuff there and you feel that they're all standing awkward and you want them to get in place, Whenever you mess around with things that just looks like it's left over from the process, it's actually just stabilizing what is already there. So, a few paintings from that period. Yeah, good friend. Taking a nap, <laughs> also objects from my living room. And I decided a painting should just be anything that you like. You just place there. It's been cut in the wrong way. I'm sorry about that. There is a color field there. Next one, this was called the new quarter. And also there was this pattern that, that you could have these kind of things that were, was coming out of the painting. It's actually all, I, at that time I would have a special saying when people would ask me, I would say, you do stuff with your painting that gets people on the dance floor. That means, no, it actually means that there has to happen something that makes people just move without they even want it. Then you start talking with them. So that's also be another thing that I've developed over the years because basically I never like an abstract entrance. That means you're looking at a painting and there's something happening. I want the painting that it should happen something that you can explain. Oh, there is, a, in this case, something architectural and there's some stuff coming out, something you can explain then maybe the feeling or the, the 
experience of the painting should be very abstract. Or you can explain it as something that you take in your hand and you're quite sure what you're holding and it just melts like an ice cream on a summer day, you know? It's just, you thought you were quite sure about what you were looking at, but then it's gone between your hands. So I always wanted, and you will see over the next images, I always wanted a concrete entrance. But basically, I wanted a very abstract exit. So still, 90s, trying, Malevich. I think this painting, ah, victory over the sun, I wouldn't be able to remember. So this is a woman with her grocery walking towards the horizon, many suns, and trying out different structures. And that was also, again, this idea of playing with the help of the viewer. Because each of you in here understands what the stupid artist is saying. He's saying, okay, that means those ones are further back and those ones are further in the front. But these are all things that we have just learned and that you can play on the edge of how much is the viewer gonna help you. Actually, the viewer, even if they don't want, they're gonna help you. They're gonna fill the gap. They say, oh, that's what he means. So just play on this edge between something is absolutely flat. And that the viewer starts saying, I know what you mean. So this was Riders from the Sky. And I remember at that time, the studio was, had a low ceiling. So the reason why the paint ran that way is I had to paint it like that, because it was simply too tall. So a painting like this is something that, that I'm still interested in. First of all, I like the idea. I think every, every painting should have like a very small, just like a small melody, like a small tune, like did, 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 and then even better, dirt. But you know, a painting like this, if you should explain it very simply, it's a train, but something happens that can't, can't happen the train goes out of the canvas <laughs> and into the painting again. And it's even so stupid that it's, it's almost embarrassed to, but that's even what excites me today, that you have something that happens outside and it gets into the work. And even better, it disappears into a tunnel. That's everything I need for a work that it has this aspect. Even you're not quite sure if the train is going in and out of the tunnel. These are the elements, I think, that keeps walking through my work. And also that there's a certain structure you're going to see again and again. And it's not something I developed. It's, I would love to say I invented that, but that's really, I think I would, somebody would throw stones after me. But that you have this, these three levels of a painting. You have kind of an entrance. That means the, the railway tracks. That means you and I, we walk in there. We walk like a train. Then we get into the middle area of the painting. Here's what's happening. We are gonna go into a tunnel, all of us together. And what's happening in the tunnel is just whatever I place here is gonna affect your imagination about the tunnel. And that's everything. There's no more to say. I could stop now. That's everything you have to know about painting. There has to be an entrance. There has to be information in the middle area of the painting that start your imagination what's happening in the place that you can't see. And even if I would put a flashlight and show you what happens in the tunnel, that would be a, the major disaster. And even, to be more honest, I also have no clue what's happening in there. We are on the same level. We always think that the artist knows about the mystery in their work. If the artist knows about the mystery in his painting, he's being responsible, but he's being a bad artist. A bad, bad artist. He sh you should, as an artist, be able to unfold certain mysteries, but if you try to control them, bad artist. <laughs> Even if you try to control the symbols, if you think you're very clever to play with the symbols, you're being responsible about the symbols, bad artist. Just another version of this structure, of these blue stripes. You can't really see it on the painting, but these are stripes of layers of paper. The reason for these layers of paper is that, actually, there are two, I know there's so many students, so there are two explanations. The one that is especially for students is, in the beginning, you develop structures or tricks for you to overcome what you can't do. 
in the beginning, very early on, I couldn't stand the feeling of painting on a dry canvas when the paint starts go. So I always painted, you know, thin white so the brush would go like this. But that was a, it only lasted for, for a little while. Those tricks only last for a while. Also, I, I couldn't in the beginning stand to have too much energy. So in the beginning when I started painting, when I was still a student, Monday red, Tuesday blue, next day green, black, brown, Friday night you do the painting. Because then you're tired, you worn yourself down. Those are just tricks, or even better to say tools, that you teach yourself according to your problems. When, the, when, when it's done, you put your tool away and you pick up a new tool. The tool in this painting is very simple. If you have stripes and you're going to paint a boat, you can always have the chance to let the boat disappear into the painting. It's good that there's not a wire. You see here, the ship is supposed to be here, but it just disappears in there. And again, the viewer is so helpful. They are, oh, we understand what the artist is talking about. The, the ship is just inside the painting. You know, it's, it's even, it's so stupid to explain it, but this is actually what is happening. So I hope that's enough of the blue ones. Again, you have an idea. You realize in the middle of the painting that a road with fruits that's, that's on a marsh, they're on a walk towards the end of the painting. And then in the middle of it, you decide this is no good idea. Is there any way to do some kind of destruction? Because I come out of when I was a student early on, I destroyed everything. And I'm not saying this in a heroic way. I really destroyed. I think the only thing that's changed over the years is that I destroy very slowly now. I destroy similar, somebody putting up, how do you call it, nail polish? Like very precise. That's the way I destroy now. So this one is like, in the middle of it, you understand you fail. So, so at least fail in grand style. I, for a long time, I was looking for possibilities to paint figures. And I, this is another version of I had I used this title a few times, and kind of the idea of a new neighborhood or a new area. So that maybe some of you is going to recognize. This is a record cover from the 70s. I can't remember the band, but somebody said it? <laughs> Never mind. But this was first time, and you know, you go from one figure. So I do a little eyes, you know, because I come out of a generation of artists. We don't trust eyes. We don't trust the nose, especially no fingers. I don't even want to mention feet. You just don't want to go into that debate. <laughs> and even worse, what about emotions? Figures, should they have emotions? That was a no-go. And I think I spent, you will see at the end, I spent maybe 15 years just walking slowly into this arena. So still this painting had to be done, walking a little bit forward, pulling back. You could say tongue in cheek, but it's not really the right, right way to say it. But you all the time had to find these kind of tools that you could go into the painting from the side. You could jump over or go in that way. But this was the first time where I was kind of satisfied putting up a group of figures. And you see there are certain places where I just left them out because I had no more courage. I said, I used all my courage. They just have to be blank. And there's another thing, when you do a painting, if you keep your integrity, you understand, I can't, I can't. If you just leave it open, then it's going to be, you know, everybody's just going to think of it as a plus, as something, as a, as a, not as a failure. It's just, it's actually just part of a, maybe art and painting is the only place that can actually embrace that, that thing that you say, no, I can't. Yeah. Again, actually quite flat, but we all know what I, what, what Tal is thinking about. This is a cemetery, last garden, there are trees, they get smaller, the higher, there's a yellow road. This painting was actually coming from a completely different place. It came from, Edward Munch did paintings of trees, like yellow trees lying in the forest. 
very awkward, very complicated composed paintings. And I kind of sneaked into his painting by just doing this yellow road that leads straight up, but actually you can also understand it that it disappeared somehow in the horizon. It gets more close to the monk painting. Here we are in this kind of wood. And it's, it's a tree and it's also some, some kind of character. Again, there is this paper that I, I used. And again, I just couldn't stand the idea of trees that goes all the way down. I just couldn't stand it, so I had to break it up. So again, you find a tool. Instead of killing the painting or vomiting on it, you just develop these kind of tools. And after a while, you put just these tools away. So this is just to... I had a scholarship in a, a, like in a small German town, smallest of all towns in the world. And I remember walking around, and there were posters of, a, you should call it like a lunar park, like a park where there's a Paris wheel. Paris wheel, you understand this? Where you sit, and you go up, and you go down. And I thought, it's a very poetic image that you go up and you sit there and you go down, you know, like smile now, cry later, something like this. <laughs> and I tried, but I couldn't really, I couldn't get the Paris wheel right. But I understood, oh, this is a kind of a funny image that it, it's a bit cheesy in a way to have an image where it explodes and you can put all the things that you like, like the explosion, and if people ask you why, you say, that's my brain, it exploded. Anything you're gonna say when you're just out of art school. <laughs> so I took it one step further and I started playing with this, this idea. The other thing was that I, I, I think you have a word for it, hoarder. Hoarder? So it runs in my family. And it's something you should, you should keep it under control. You should fight it <laughs> like you fight the devil. Um, it means that you have a hungry hand, and the hand just picks up stuff. You go to the dentist, and there is all these brochures, all this material about anything that society wants to tell you, and you just, you just love it. You love an image where there's a brochure for women who is pregnant without a man, and then they can go to a course where they can make a plaster cast of their belly. Then they feel less alone. And you pick up that material, your hand just need that. You just need it. And after a few years, you have a mountain in your studio of things that you just need. You don't even know why anymore. So on one hand, you, you fail the Paris wheel, but you have all this stuff. So you created a structure where you can glue all the stuff on it and get away. And you can even argue why you need more. So, yeah. <laughs> More needs more, you know? These, uh, after, I, I did, after I did this one and I did maybe one more, I understood that's over. That means that for me, when something is over, I call it, I don't want the work to turn into Persian carpets. What means a Persian carpet? A Persian carpet is something really sophisticated where there's so much craft putting into all the, the weaving. I don't want my work to go in that direction. I want it to stay where it still has a discussion. It is not, again, me being like a, a nice person. I get very lazy if I don't feel I'm, I'm in this kind of like, f not fight that makes it too romantic, but there's this struggling going on. And I understood after I stabilized this idea with images, I could stop. But then I also, at that time, I got all of these, these requests for going places to teach or give lectures. And I thought, I know this way so well. Why not have a studio where you invite people and just let them play with you? So for a three-year period, I had a studio called Adjure Interesting or interessant, that's, a Jew interessant is actually, it's no real language, it's in between German, Dutch, and Scandinavian language, and French maybe. So it's a 
nonsense in a way. But it means go, goodbye everything interesting. It means goodbye everything your hand picks up. And in a three years period, I did nine of these collages where a lot of different students came and slept there and we did workshops. I even sent people out to find material, just glue it up there. And we had concerts, we had workshops. So it was very, I used it instead of doing, just doing Persian carpets, I kind of spread the collage out to be a more social thing. Like a lot of people would sit there and almost weave on them because they are done so detailed. So they're done like, like by Rain Man. It's like there's such an amount of detail that you have to be mad or communion to do them. I think, I, I mean, for some reason, they have been very popular. I think in a superficial way, I understand why, but I don't think that they are really that great artworks. I think that they, they have a point, and they put that point in front, and that's it. I don't feel that there's any movement in them beyond that point, so I would never go back doing them. Um, a lot of the time, I'm in one family of work, and then I start another kind of family of work, meantime, same time. Sometime in the beginning, I start slowly, and the super way, it came out of, again, Monk. And it doesn't, actually doesn't mean that, I'm, that Monk is my favorite artist. It's just a coincidence that I mentioned him twice. But he has, he has a painting where he's standing like, it is called something like between the clock and the bed. And he's standing there, old man, ready to fly away and die. And uh, there's a bread spread, like a blanket on his bed that's painting very, painted very similar to this. And afterwards, I found out several artists have been inspired by this blanket. For some reason, this blanket like points further than Munk. It's just, it's, just, it's just 20 years ahead of him. And I always, I, I love that pattern. I, I took this pattern out and then I decided, okay, I need more clear answers from the work that I'm doing. If I need more clear answers, why not, you know, just use the colors from that blanket? So in a three years period, I, in the studio, I only had like seven buckets of paint. You know, I had a red one, I had like a yellow, I had a brown, a black, a white. Yeah, anything you can see there, <laughs> you can count them yourself. But that meant not a very special red, like, oh, I need this kind of, no, just like the word red. Oh, give me a red. Oh, yeah, I pass you the red. Oh, can I have a brown? Yeah, I give you the brown. Something where, because usually the debate in the studio is about kind of getting the right color, finding out, you know, to speak in the world of colors. And I actually, I wanted to kind of get out of that discussion, just say brown as the word brown. So I did a whole group of painting that all my interest, all the Motive, I'd simply put through those seven buckets. Um, again, it's just another tool. It's just something to, the moment you understand that you're starting to make kind of an institution out of it, you just leave it alone. You go somewhere else, you put it behind you. Again, here I'm trying something. It's, even for me, it's interesting to see it. It's called Model Alone in the Studio, and it's, it is a model in the studio. And again, scared, I try to do nose, eyes, and I think I even draw them. I, I just, it's just a drawing. I didn't even dare. I actually, this painting is done like this. I do a drawing. You know, the amateur way of doing a painting is that you do a drawing, and then you start filling it out. That's a disaster. And that's exactly how I tried this painting. I would say, okay, I try this idea with a drawing, and then I asked the question, where can I enter in a normal way? A normal, if I, I use another more hippie approach, where can I enter my drawing in a natural way? In a way where it, where it actually happens by itself, that there is a way I can color, you know, I can color that area, that's okay. That you understand very clearly that you have a conscious and also a very con unconscious debate inside. Like when I say, I don't trust hands, I don't trust, I don't talk about feet, I don't trust nose and eyes. 
That's a debate for some reason. And just forget about asking why you have this debate. You have this debate. And it's good. That means you have problems, artist problems. Then you try to answer. You try to get around your so-called problems. So in this one, I try to get into the idea of a model in a studio without the artist. The artist is out. The artist is gone. It's just the model alone. And she's lifting up her blouse. It's not for you. It's not for me. It's just for the painting. Another version of the Superway. It's, I actually, I mix it up now. I'm sorry, because there's green here. So, OK, I like this painting still. Death of a Lady. It comes from a, the bed is from a, a drawing that uh, Hans Christian Andersen made when he was traveling in Italy. Uh, he just made a drawing of his bed. He was quite a paranoid character. He would always have a rope next to his bed so he could always climb out of the window. Maybe in a way it's a quite good idea. But then there is this black silhouette and very simplified and there's only these seven colors and just playing with how much do you need to, to put in there. Also, it's important to say that not, none of these paintings are done just going there and just start to paint, just go with the flow. You go with the flow for 99 of you. Maybe some of you are Jesus out there. So you're the 1% that doesn't need something in your pocket to start a painting. But the rest of you need something. At least you need something to fail with or something to run away from. So always when I start, there is a certain idea. There's a certain direction. Without a direction, there's no painting for me. Then there's something that doesn't make sense. But you know, you're in your studio alone every day. You need your own jokes. You need your, you need your own escapes. So I remember that this was in an exhibition in May 07. But it's dated like in July. That means there are two months where people are going to be confused. Now it doesn't matter. But I remember it gave me a real weird feeling of power that I had two months where I could plan it ahead. <laughs> also mixed up, it's also after this, or just before the seven colors, because there's green, it's a Beatles cover. Again, playing around. I could handle people with masks better than real people. So this painting gave me less trouble. Also, a thing that keeps repeating. And I tried also when I played with the seven colors. Also, another thing that's almost as stupid as dating something two months ahead. I could have at least done two years ahead, but that's too much. Then it becomes, then it becomes too much. So in this, what about writing the word red with a green color? That's all. I can't explain you how much... Um, entertainment this gives me. <laughs> and I, even when I do it, I think I'm, I'm a genius. That's the only time I feel like a genius is when I write the word black with white. And it makes no sense. That's why I tell you. <laughs> Another kind of taking the main area of the painting, the place naturally where the eye is going to go, and just put a black square there. Or something that is kind of stretched out and there's a big wide open in the middle of the painting. How much can you place close to the edge? Again, playing with these words, red, bl black, brown, green, and the opposite. Gold is over. Um, I think what I've always done with my work is I, I've always been fishing in my own work. That means that as I said before, this is like, I would say, a very abstract painting. You still have an up and down. But you sit there and you watch your painting, and maybe you suffer because you understood that part of the painting failed. But you understand that also something succeeded, something you didn't plan to succeed, fishing. You just fish it out, and maybe you give it a whole painting. Maybe this was just a detail. Maybe this was something under the table in the girl, the model alone in the studio. So around 2008, 
I'm just going to show a few paintings there. I was out of the seven colors, and I was kind of walking around with, and I could understand that something started happening. It's like you understand that you are going down a hill, not in a bad way, down a hill, like the show is over or something like that. But I understood I could smell the next level of my painting would be much more ornamental, much more simple, narrative pushed out. This was something, there was a movement that I started myself. I couldn't blame any, anybody. This is something that I pushed further and further with the seven colors. I went, I was painting some teenagers on a beach and I could sense this all the time that there was just a very few things holding it back from just being dots or lines or stripes. This is just the weather on the beach. And I could sense that this is where it's gonna go. And that's why I show this one. This was the last painting from that period. This is also still the beach. Certain abstract ideas about the weather and phew, I could say nice things, but I, I remember something about the weather. So I suddenly had this idea that I, at least just for, just for a year or two years, I wanted to carve out a valley in my own production of very clear narratives more clear than I've ever done before. Something that I could, I could call any of you and say, oh, I just did a painting of two gentlemen facing each other. One is holding a gun, the other is probably a captain. And one is wearing kind of a, yeah, what, what you always steal in hotels. What are they called? R yeah, yes. And there is a weird character in the back. I wa and I started, and I said, okay, if I'm, going to do this, I'm also going to change technique so I'm not in my normal safe zone. So I started painting with like rabbit skin glue and pigments. The only, the only thing about that medium is that you can't really edit a lot. It seems like when you work, you go like this, and at the end, if it doesn't work, you start all over. You start a new painting. So you have to be quite precise. It's like it's not a something you want to fool around with very early, or at least it would have been a disaster for me when I was younger. I needed oil paint, which is like, just being like a sculpture, you can just blah, 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 you can just move it around, and this one, you, you can't move it that way, it is slowly. You put, man, you add layers, you build up the colors like this. So in a way, it's more, I can't find a better word than academic, but it is a wrong word, but it's a word in the arena of the word academic. A ship, you are inside again, those three steps, you are inside in the room, the viewer's in there, sitting in the dark room. Then there's kind of a balcony, even the viewer can go out there, and then there's a ship, just, you know, passing by for a moment. And there's a certain call in that moment, there's a certain, you're looking at the ship, and the ship even has the notion of being something that looks back on you. And there's this meeting. We don't know where the ship is going, we don't know where the ship is coming from. I also don't know. I should know. I told you this earlier. And I don't want to be in the category of bad artist. So I got even more into playing with figures. I got over my idiosyncrasy. I, at least I could do something that looked like hands or do something that looked like faces. Even they're very simplified. I dared getting more closer. I also art historically I started getting more interested in paintings before, yeah, let's say before the camera was something that people could buy. That means that in painting, characters would never be standing like this. They would always be posing. So I played a lot with, I looked a lot on the art where people are actually really posing for the painting, that they get into character to be in a painting. Um, the thing is that the ideas behind the paintings are all, it's always the same. That's something that moves very slowly. The thing that I push into the painting has actually nothing to do with art. These are just the things that each of us find interesting, is important for us, private stuff. But the weird thing is, I think what you really have to learn as an artist is that whenever there's something that is really important for you, we think that that's the most natural thing to paint. But that's actually asking for the biggest 
punch on your nose you can ever ask for. Because what feels important in your living room with your parents when they did this and this to you, when this wants to walk into a painting, you get a punch on your nose because it doesn't work like that. So somehow, what you all the time are looking for as an artist are tools to make this connection. Very often quite brutal tools. That means if you want to, there's something that, and what means a lot for you is not something you have to think about. That's something that means a lot for you. Sometimes it's like carnival. It has to find, or it's like, ah, even better on the plane yesterday. I saw a bad, scary movie where somebody is uh, possessed by a demon. So private material is a demon that needs to possess things. It could be a flower. You look at the flower and you understand, this flower, this Morandi flower is perfect for my demon. I bent the flower towards my demon. That's actually how I find a way of doing it. A boy, again, you still have this feeling, is he going to fall? Does it mean that he's far and he's wearing these pajamas? For a second, he's wearing this kind of African mask. Um, I'm going to go a little bit quick forward because there's a certain image and I understand that I only have three more minutes. So I'm just going to say a few words for each of the image. Men that can't sit on horses. Horses are as bad as feet. So if I don't want to even talk about feet, I don't even want to say the word, the, the word horse. So again, I think that's for all artists, not just painters. You always try to enter what you can't do or what you can't talk about. Horses. I was, when I did this, I was very happy about myself. Finally, a horse. <laughs> People sitting on a balcony, these kind of characters that kind of blurs into the background. One of my favorite Matisse paintings, I think it's his sons playing chess. So it's, it's not the wrong way around. It has to be like this. I simply, again, I, what I said earlier, I did a drawing the amateur way. I did a drawing of the Matisse painting and I said, where is it possible with all my idiosyncrasy or a better word for that, with my education, with my own private academy, how can I enter this painting? So whenever in a natural way I could enter, I would paint it. I don't want it to be the right way because then there's too much attention on, on the, the Matisse painting. It should just be a painting. And it should be me trying to answer this. Again, these kind of corridors, some kind of character sitting there alone. This is from a tiny drawing I saw in a museum once for refugees. I think he's actually not a refugee. I think he's a guard from the Ottoman Empire. He has these kind of Turkish hats on. So, oh. Nobody's going to push me away from the stage. I need five more minutes. <laughs> Dare you get up here, push me away. <laughs> so again, especially for all of the students here, this describes, and if you should leave with one thing in your pocket from this, this is this explanation. It's the third time I explain it. This is a framer. This is a framer that I saw. And you know, there's all these empty frames. Already the idea of a shop with empty frames is, it's almost on the edge of being like, like a cheesy pop song. But it's kind of okay. It will do the job. Framer, a framer at night and no pictures in the frames. That means you, you start playing with the thing. You can walk here. You can make the decision. The artist has to get the person into the shop. He has to get the people on the dance floor. That means go into the shop. Okay, the viewer says, okay, I'm f okay. I you made it, I'm going to go in there. They open the door and they're in there. And in there, there's this different information. There are these empty frames and you stand in there. But most important, there is the back room where only you can kind of imagine what's in there. So not, even I don't know, but this is actually what it's about. It's one, two, three, all the time. One, two, three. Just expressed in different variation. At that time, I was going further and further just to make it more and more simple. 
to make a painting which is just about a man walking on the street. And that's a certain curve in his walk. That's it, just a man walking. Man sitting on a bridge with a funny hat, a bottle of milk perhaps. I guess it was not milk. Also, this is, a, I don't know how well you can see it. This is, if you, want, if you want to kill yourself as a painter, try to paint the moon reflecting in water. That means you have a composition of two holes like this. How to handle that, you find your way. But it's, uh, you have to find, yeah, here's a color version of the same. It's just the moon reflecting. Okay, I asked for five, so I'm just only gonna use five. So there's another, another thing just at the end here that after finding out that hands and feet, they are possible, I started being interested in, wo in working in what I call real time. That means the possibility for the painter not always to be in the studio, but actually to sit in the landscape or even sit in front of somebody asking somebody, Excuse me, can I make a drawing of you? And you know, for all kind of probably good reason, this was taken out of the main arena of art. Usually again, it's only amateurs doing something or your aunt or your uncle in the, the suburbs who's sitting and drawing in the forest. So the question is, is it just a romantic idea or is it productive for you to sit out there? So. During the summer, I just went, I, did, I didn't go very special places. I went to the same three places next to my, to my summer house, and I was just painting outside. What nature teaches you is it teaches you brutality, because there's just too much going on there. There's just too much, so you have to make up your mind to say, okay, in front of me is this bush, and there's just so much. How am I ever going to go home for lunch? <laughs> that means you just go. Boom. And the moment you just say a bush is just a boom, you translated, you did the brutal act. You are being irresponsible. <laughs> so here's more nature works. Okay, last thing I think I'm gonna talk about. Then I went further. I took three years where I said, okay, pink paper, mostly pink paper, Having it in a suitcase, very special suitcase. It has to be a very special suitcase. And whenever I would go somewhere, I would make appointments and just draw. And you enter a hotel room with mostly a stranger, and you have a debate with them, is it going to be with or without clothes? It's embarrassing. It's intimidating. Not so much for the other person, but for me, it's terrible. Again, is it productive, or is it just a romantic is it just a romantic idea? And I did this, and it, I think I, I can just recommend it, to find ways, it doesn't matter if you are a painter, or whatever you do, where you find the ability to work in real time. That means you're doing the work while you're there. It means it, it only, it, it happens while you're sitting there. Because it gives you a, a great feeling of time. And it can be, you can be more you can have a better imagination than me. It doesn't have to be nature and naked people. And here I, I started really loving when I got to the point of the hand. Because I was always saying, how, how wrong can it, ha can it go? And there would always be new ways for it to go wrong. <laughs> In the beginning, I also always ask, even if the, if the model was not, a, was not a smoker, please have a cigarette in your hand. And it was not to be politically incorrect or anything. It was just, I just needed this as an object between them and me. You could almost say like an antenna. That there, if there was a secret, and even if there was smoke, there would be this element between us. After a while, I also didn't need that tool in a way. I could do without it. But in the beginning, it was helpful with the cigarette. It's also a weird thing when you know every painting happened somewhere. This happened somewhere. It's not just found images. It's not just something you imagine. This happened. And then I took the drawings. I had all the drawings on the floor in the studio, and I asked, is there any of these drawings that still has enough question, enough stuff 
that I can bring them into painting. And this was from a drawing. That's the only painting that, that comes from a drawing that was from a drawing class. It, it was in New York, like in a private house, five artists and a model. And I thought, and the dogs were lying there. These are actually dogs. If, I, you all know that. You can see that very clearly. <laughs> I don't have to explain you anything, right? Oh, I'm sorry. But uh, <laughs> the body has many possibilities. And then, this is a painting I also I still like. Always, you know, you, you draw, you try very, you know, you understand that you're insecure. You understand that you have all these emotions before you start. You have all these things. All these so-called artist problems. The only thing is to find a way to unfold them. So if you start and you understand, I'm not well prepared, how much do I actually have for this painting? And just leave what exactly you have, what exactly, you know, this, I, I had this for the painting. Everything I do beyond this point is just me trying to excuse myself. So if you leave it exactly at that point, it's still going to be like a beautiful painting. And I, I talked with a friend today, and he referred to this as a boy in the shower. And uh, he can keep dreaming. This is a, a very skinny girl in the shower. Oh! <laughs> so, you remember the moon reflecting in water. <laughs> I think we are almost at the end. Ah, yeah, no, no, we go back. The last of these paintings was actually, and it's also, actually, it's a drama similar as a Rihanna song, something very banal. Just imagine if I would tell you, I mean, even if, if a student would tell me something, I have said, don't do it. I want to paint a mirror, a black mirror. You can say that's the most stupid idea. Here it is, black mirror. So that family of naked drawings and paints and mirror are, are over also now, that's also finito. And uh, I'm just going to show you just fresh things. I'm not going to say much about it. Two different versions of the same. And this was the first one. And the next one, I understood that the bench that she's sitting on had possibilities. I could explore the ben bench, you say? Yeah, where she's sitting on it. I'm, I can explore it. I can get it in as a partner. Because the woman is kind of in her own world. We are actually... She's sitting there, but somebody's looking back. Maybe the, the thing looking back at us is part of the reason why she's sitting. Or maybe there's this play between the bench and her that I, I tried. Oh, here we are. Deaf Institute. The eye, the eye in the playground of the Deaf Institute. And in a color version. And that's it. Finito. And I think that you are allowed to ask questions <laughs> if you want. Maybe you're all tired. So you can ask anything you want. Yes? I think somebody is giving you a microphone. Sort of, I'm, I'm a former painter. I mean, I still paint, but um, I, I got scared off by the gallery system. So I guess I, I wanted to ask you a bit more about courage and and being not self-conscious. Uh, and and maybe it's easier as a man, but I, you know, I'm just sort of curious, and, I'm, and maybe it's even a rhetorical question. But how do you how do you deal with that? How do you cope with like um, a kind of the mirror effect of the, the gallery system. Oh, the gallery system. Yeah, yeah. I, 
I can say that you, I mean, I think it's different today. I have a feeling that art students today very early on knows about this system. Know that there is also a game going on that you can decide to play or not and how you want to be in that game. I only got to know about the, so the, what you call the gallery system when I was in the middle of it. Because it just happened, you know, very fast. Um, I think that if I knew what I know today, I would have done things quite differently. I think I wouldn't have been able to do it differently, but at least I would like to be clever now and say I would have done certain things differently. Mm. I think it's a, you can say that you get scared about the art system, but I think it's, a, I think it's not the right, the right thing to say. You have to understand that the art system is also scared by the artist. And you have to kind of believe in that. Um, I, you know what I hate? I hate when artists, they start complaining about auctions. I think that's really a sellout. Oh, people, they put my work at auction. I think, what's the problem? Everything goes to the flea market sooner or later. <laughs> Even you and me, you know? So what's the big deal? So you just have to find your way in those kind of, because they're not, they're not system like, in, like, like a stone or a tree. It's things that you can, you can decide how to communicate with that. And actually, you are, as an artist, you, you can find your way in that. I don't know if I answered, I tried. More. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we should ask my parents. But <laughs> Tal is, uh, I, I was born uh, outside Tel Aviv in Israel in 67. And uh, by a Danish mother and an Israeli father. And Tal is a very normal name in Israel. And uh, we moved to Denmark just right after I was born. And in Denmark, Tal is an absolute disaster name because it means nothing. It actually means number. It means like, so as a kid, when I would say my name is Tal, they're going to say, yeah, but what's your real name? So it doesn't exist as a name where I grew up. I'm, I'm on the, the edge of being, I can't even pronounce that word right, deglectic. I can't, I can't spell, I couldn't write a letter without 100 mistakes. So the reason for the R is just that Rosenschweig <laughs> is damn difficult to spell, and I understand it. So I just simply, very early on, I, and very early, even when I was in school, I mean, when I was uh, 10, I mean, I always played with my name. I always thought it had a certain plastic in its, uh, inside. So I just very early on, I took it away. Maybe also you have to understand that being Jewish in America is, is common. When you're Jewish in Scandinavia, you are like exotic minority. And to have a name that's not a name, and a second name that puts you in the ghetto of, uh, you know, Czechoslovakia, of Prague, it's just too much for a blonde kid. You just want to hang out, you know, and uh, be like anybody. <laughs> so. Somewhere in between, that's the explanation of my name. Yes? Yeah? Just speak loud. knowing when it's done and the completion of the work and feeling confident, if that makes any sense. Okay, there's many questions, but let's just take one. Okay. <laughs> because that's always the interesting question about when, when is the painting yeah, done? Like when, are, you, are you an art student? I, art history, I went here for okay. two years and transferred. Because the thing is, the truth is that when you, do, when you start from the beginning, according to how educated you are, 
you notice here's the possibility to finish it. If you don't take, if you don't take the bus, you go on. Oh, again, here's the possibility to stop. It's not like every painting just have one bus stop. Mm -hmm. The more you work on them, the, usually the longer is between those stops. And the stop where the, now you say now, it's not, it's not a point, it's not a dot. It's actually a debate room. It's a room you enter and say, in this room in here, in this, in this painting, is in this discussion now. I have to kind of finish it inside this discussion. If I move ahead, I'm in another discussion. I can't go back. So it's, it's always a question where artists should give very heroic answers, but it's not like that. I, can, I mean, at, at least not for me. It's much more something you can move and play with. Thank you. Up here. Um, uh, going back to the idea of community, I know you curated a show at CFA for your students. Yes. Um, and I've seen you work with Jonathan Messe, and I've seen you and Daniel Richter talk about each other's works, and you moved around a lot. Um, so back to this idea of like community and how those guys and um, how they've helped you. Or how, or what the importance of that is for you? Yeah. Again, to do it very kind of simple. You know, you have ideas in your in your pocket, and the ideas has no have no no limits. They have no 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 form. They have no material. Then you look and you decide, okay, I I get this idea, and I put it into a film. Or I make a nice dress out of it, if you, if you are that broad in your practice. But even sometimes there can be certain ideas that it makes sense that you do it with somebody else. But it actually, if the desire comes from outside, like I want to work with somebody, it's more complicated, it's more easy that you have a certain idea. In the case with Jonathan Meese, we had a certain friendship where there were certain kind of talks that only him and I could have. And then there were certain ideas that we could, we could address similar. The idea of the mother. So with him, it had, it had a natural reason to do it like that. And very often, friendship is not enough. It can, I think even if you say it should be with a friend, you're on a wrong track. It's, it all goes back to the idea. When I did the big collage, it was simply the only way I could continue. That what if I if I did it with a group of other people, alone I would be too too lazy. I needed you know, it simply asks for other people this idea. Otherwise, it wouldn't be possible. <laughs> Thank you. That was fantastic. Um, I want to pick up on something that Terry mentioned in his intro about your relationship with the history of art and. As you know, we're a museum school, um, and so we often bring our students into the museum. And you noted Edvard Munch and Matisse, and there's a lot of early modernism that I'm seeing in the work. And I'm wondering why. What is it about early modernism that you're attracted to? I think for the first, uh, when I was an art student, and even five, six, seven years after art school, I mean, I rarely went to the museums. I would, it would, just an image in a book would be enough. I learned everything from just watching, because what I really needed from the images was just the drawing. I didn't need the feeling of standing in front of me. Even, I would say, that would kill me at that time. I just needed the kind of, I could even have an image this size to, to get the information that I needed. I think my interest in art, before it was much more about um, folk art, like applied art, anything done outside the main arena of art. At a certain point, my, I think my own work pushed me into really being interested in art history. Not art history as something that is on a line. Like, I wouldn't approach it, I think, like an art historian, but I actually approach it like, a, like when you go into a buffet. Because whenever you, you are working with a certain group of work, you are in a debate, and there are certain answers you need. Who has the worst or the best answer in this debate? Then you go for Valotan. Then you go for Balthus. 
I would even say, I can't even say that I, it's about whether I like them or not. It's not even about that. It's just information. It, not, not necessarily technical, more structure, how they structure things. And I need this information. Even if I would go, I remember I went to see the Picasso show in New York, the sculpture show. I went only, and that's quite extreme, to go all the way just to see one show. I spent one hour in the museum. I don't want to spend more. I just want to go in, and then you, you, you get in contact with the work, you understand certain structures, things, then you go out. Maybe you buy a postcard on the way out. Um, also, my interest in art has mainly been after 1850. I'm very rarely interested in art. There are few of them that I can, and I'm not talking about interest in an academic way. I can't, I can't use them really. I can usually use after when, that, when art was in the popular way set, set free, when art didn't work for the church or for the nobles, when you can just, it's just about painting something on the field. That's where my art history starts, at least for now. A little bit before as well, maybe the golden age, around 1840. But anything before that, I, I, I try, but it has no interest. So modernism, you know, if you, you're interested in saying, okay, how to draw figures, then actually the last 150 years is just like 10 minutes. It's just people circular, circling around the same questions. You know, how, how to answer, because if you are, I went to the art, art school in the 90s, you entered representation like tongue in cheek, like ironical, you could do it like that. And you always, I mean, I think many artists try, is there more not being regressive, not being like vintage, but are there ways to walk into it? And if art history decided we don't need people in the painting, we don't need these kind of stories anymore, then it's a good question why everybody here in the pocket have a phone that all the time shows whatever they're doing, how they're posing. We still need to see each other. We need, and maybe even more, you, we need painters because painting from the very beginning is stupid. So we trust the painting. We don't really trust the iPhone in the pocket. We know that there's all these filters. But if somebody's painting boy walking, we know, ah, oh, this is just this wet material on an old blanket. We said it's, it, it's actually in a way, in a weird way, it's without power. So we trust it. In a, in, a, in a way, painting has a possibility to speak in, in the now again. Or maybe I'm just imagining, but I'm working on, this is my interest now, that as an artist that you can speak quite directly about now. Mm. Because the photographers, they are under pressure in that area. They are actually pushed a little bit back now. So can paint, painters enter that without being like regressive? Yes? Um, my, sim my question is kind of similar to the last one. I'm up here. Hi. Um, I know I have one class and I know that in the coming weeks they're going to ask me why, this, why is this piece a painting or why is this painting acrylic as opposed to oil, and why are you a painter? Um, I'm wondering what your answer would Where be. Where are you sitting? Put your hand up. Okay. Are you there? Okay. Whoa. <laughs> yes, oil and acrylic. I'm wondering what your answer would be yeah. to this question, or what you think of answering I these really questions. didn't get the question. I have to get it again. I couldn't see you, and then I couldn't listen properly. <laughs> okay. I... I'm going to be asked why my paintings are acrylic, acrylic as opposed to oil, or why is it a painting at all rather than a photograph, or why are you a painter? I'm wondering what your, your answer to those questions would be. Oh, that's a lot of questions. <laughs> so you said something about painting opposed to photography? Yeah. Did I also hear you said something oil against acrylic? Yeah, there's a lot of questions. Okay. When, breaking down your work and why is it something rather than something else? I think I, in a way I answered already this about photography, saying that I think more now today, things done with hands, full of mistakes, and that painting is also about what didn't happen, 
what didn't succeed. And uh, a pain that tries to drive somewhere, it drives towards something. I think more than ever, we, it's something society, or we all need that. It wasn't a very academic question, and I'm not sure I could answer this in, an, in a real academic way. Oil and acrylic, and I'm not being rude now, but I'm going to tell you a little joke, the only joke that I know about art. <laughs> so we have a garden. You know, in this garden, it's, it's the IQ garden. It's how the further in, the further in the garden, the more intelligent people are. So in the middle of the garden, there's two philosophers sitting there, and they are discussing the meaning of life. You know, they're sitting there and they're talking. You go a little bit further to the entrance, that there's the people who are into mathematics, and they're discussing, you know, infinity, whatever. At the gate, two painters are sitting, and the one painter is asking the other, are you using oil or acrylic? <laughs> <laughs> 